a video in a little bit here. Uh, thank you, Austin, for the nice introduction and Bill, great, great speech. I was uh, kind of taken aback when I realized what this group was about. Uh, my only reservation about being here tonight is there's so much to talk about, and as I understand it, I'm between you guys and dinner, so it's, 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 it's not a good place for me. I'm hoping that I can do the introduction, get your interest on what's going on in space, and have some time for questions, because I think questions, particularly from this group, are going to be very important. So hopefully we can fit that all in. Uh, but since most of you are all in school, and I think very few of you were around on this planet, when I first flew in space almost 30 years ago, I have a quiz question. And the question is, how many people are in, how many humans are in space right now? Anybody guess? Four. Four. No, I haven't heard the right number yet. Four. Zero. Zero. Three. 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 I think they've had 47 expeditions. They do an expedition about every five months of them. And the space station uh, is this large thing about the size of a football field. It weighs 500 tons. It's going 17,000 miles an hour plus a little bit. It goes around the Earth every 88 minutes. And we have 16 countries that are all working together to have this gateway uh, for what we will do, not only now in space, but in the future. And so, when I show you the video, I want you to think about some questions. And I, I would ask myself, watching what I'm going to show you, I say, well, why do we have a space station? Um, you know, what is it about? What, what is its purpose? And given that we understand that and we, we buy into that, um, you know, is it achieving these goals? And even more to the point, especially for this group here, what do these uh, tenets of our space program, our international space program, what does it mean for the future? What are we, what are we seeing now that will affect the way you and probably even your families when you start having families, you know, what they're going to live like? And that's that's something that the space program and space station is digging into right now, and that's why it's important. Myself, I consider myself to be one of the most lucky people uh, going. I joined the Navy. I wanted to be a pilot. Um, it didn't work out that way. I went into the Frogman Underwater Demolition Community, which is now the Navy SEALs. And I worked uh, in the Pacific. Uh, Latin and, and South America, I worked in Europe, I worked in the Mideast, and I trained with my counterparts from foreign uh, nations in probably 15 different circumstances. What I, what I didn't realize was when I had the chance to go to NASA, and particularly to work on a space station, this background that I had trying to work with Koreans in South Korea, or uh, Norwegians in Norway, even Germans and French in Europe, gave me a background on how to relate to people and to make a cohesive team out of people who might not even speak the same language. And this is very much kind of the way uh, Space Station is coming together now. So in 1984, I was a Navy guy. I put into NASA to be an astronaut. I went down to Houston, got selected, and was very fortunate. I had three uh, space shuttle flights, and one of them was a big uh, science mission. Uh, Allison talked about it. It's a probe called Ulysses. It's still traveling out in space, and it's going over the top of the poles of the sun. 
This probe is going 138,000 miles an hour. It's the fastest thing that humans have ever made, and it's still out there doing its job. Another interesting thing about my time in space, in 1992, I was on the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, and we were flying over the Caribbean, and uh, our free time, you're supposed to take cameras out and take pictures of the Earth, and before you're flying, uh, the photography team gets together and they give you a big catalog of places around the Earth that they'd like pictures of, because they're interesting <coughs> things. And these could be volcanoes, uh, they could be coral reefs, they could be structures in the desert, man-made objects, whatever. And so one day, I'm sticking this big camera out the window and we're flying over to Yucatan, and I'm firing away just to shoot the camera. And I'm an engineer, and I don't really have a lot of time for scientific things, but after our mission concluded, we were all back in Houston, and it takes about two or three weeks for all the film to get developed and people to see it the thousands of frames and kind of look at what's this a picture of, and where was the shuttle when they were shot, and which way was the camera pointing, and all that, so they can kind of extract what this is a picture of. And so you have this slideshow, if you will, after you get back, and our crew is sitting in this room full of scientists looking at these pictures, and they got to the shot, one of the shots that I uh, captured over the Yucatan. And so, uh, when a scientist takes his laser pointer and looks at the picture, and it has these black dots over the land, and then there's the blue ocean. And the black dots are places where <coughs> The ground has subsided because it, they have a lot of rain, a lot of precipitation, and it percolates through the ground because it's limestone, and it makes these sinkholes. This is where uh, houses, like in Florida, you know, fall through some big hole once in a while. This is the same phenomenon that's happening. It's, it's down in the Caribbean as well, in Yucatan. And so he runs his laser pointer around this line of these uh, ponds, if you will, which is very clear in this picture. And he said, do you guys know what this is? And he said, no, it's a picture of the Yucatan. What do you want to see? He said, this is, this is the spot on the Earth where 85 million years ago, an asteroid, an asteroid plumped into the Caribbean and killed the dinosaurs. This was an explosion. Anybody know anything about Hiroshima? There was the uh, first use of atomic weapons in the, in the history of man. This explosion, when this asteroid went into the Caribbean, was tens of billions of times bigger than the explosion in Hiroshima. And it might happen again. And this guy said, this is one of the few pictures we've ever seen. You can look out the window and say, here's the rim of the crater where the, astronaut, the asteroid went into the ocean and killed the dinosaurs. And so, you know, you, you have some experience like that, and you think, wow, this is really a, a pretty cool place to get some perspectives that you ordinarily would not have as a terrestrial human. So, in 1996, I started forming up the first crew to the International Space Station, and I was with two cosmonauts. You'll see them in a minute. Uh, Sergei Kriklev, uh, very seasoned engineer, a man who had spent over a year continuously in space in the 90s. He was stranded in space when the Soviet Union came apart and the Russian Federation for him, he was left in space because they couldn't send a rocket up to bring him home. So his mission in space lasted well over a year and this was long before our first astronaut, Scott Kelly, who just came down, also did a year in space. Yuri Gazenko, was our other crewman, he was an Air Force colonel, and he had flown uh, fighter planes in the Russian Air Force before he was a cosmonaut. So we formed our crew up and we started our training, and the first uh, two-thirds of our mission, which lasted almost five months, uh, we flew from a Russian launch pad in the state of Kazakhstan. We talked to mission control in Moscow, we lived in a Russian module that was built in a factory uh, right outside of Moscow. And uh, the vehicle that we went into space 
with and with our lifeboat attached was also a Russian space track. We had one little piece at the end of all this that was made in the U.S. and it was a module that was hooking everything together and it's called the note. But what I'm saying is the bulk of my experience, at least in the early part of my flight, was all Russian. All Russian. And so the Russians are looking at this and they're saying, you know, wait a minute, uh, we're doing all this stuff, we're, it's our vehicle, we're controlling it, we're writing all the procedures, we're launching these guys, we're telling them what to do, and who's this American guy, Bill Shepard, who's up there calling the shots? What, you know, what the hell's going on? And it, this was, trust me, this was a, a huge political deal with the Russians. And I had a one-on-one -on -one with the head of the Russian space agency, and I said, his name was Kopta, Yuri Kopta. He was a huge guy, and he didn't speak English, and my Russian was not super good, it was passable. But, but I said, look, uh, uh, Chairman Kopta, I, I know you have a lot of anxiety about the political optics of this, but I'm going to guarantee you that my experience as a Navy frogman leading lots of different groups of people is going to be brought to bear here, and this is going to work out, and it's going to be good, and you'll be okay with it. And as, as things turned out, it was. But this is what I'm trying to get to, the, the fact that I had the background with diverse people in strange situations where it was very important to do stuff right and not screw it up. That, that gave me the tools that I needed to be a, a good participant in this team that was our crew on Space Station. So without further ado, can we bring the lights down and start the video? And I'll show you four and a half years of training in Moscow and Houston, and 141 days flying in space with Expedition 1. Okay. <laughs> Nine, eight, seven, six, five. There we go. I can give a little more volume. Okay, here we are in Houston. This is the largest swimming pool in the country, and we use it to practice diving underwater in our spacesuits. And this is kind of how we simulate being in zero gravity, but we do it on Earth. When you go in the pool, you have divers kind of carting you around, and as long as you're moving slowly, uh, the sensation is pretty good as far as being weightless. And you can see uh, one of us being carted around by two safety divers. The weight stuff in the bottom is all a mock up that looks like the space station. And our job was to be trained to be able to go outside in emergencies and hook things up in case they uh, didn't get connected right. Yuri and I, it's Yuri Gizenko, and myself, we're in a Soyuz capsule. This is our lifeboat. This is the vehicle that we ride up to space, and it's also our emergency rescue vehicle when we come back down. If you listen carefully, and look carefully, everything's in Russia. Survival training, the capsule, if we had to leave an emergency, might land in the ocean. So here we are in the Black Sea, practicing landing and then getting rescued by ships and aircraft that are sent out to find us. And it may be that the capsule comes down in the middle of nowhere. So this is winter survival training outside of Moscow. And we're uh, sent to, to build some shelter and put some food, get fire going, get on the radio and tell people where we are. And I was a SEAL for 13 years before I did this, and I, I did a lot of professional camping, so this was really fun for me. Okay, so two years, two years before we flew, the first piece of space station went up into orbit. This is a rocket, also in Kazakhstan. The black thing is the first Russian element called Sunrise, the Zarya. And it's going to space right here in the summer of 1998. Now, Zarya is in orbit. The shuttle's carrying that white thing called the node. And the node's going to 
Paul's going to dock to Zarya and hook up the node. You see it right here. And Sergei Kirklev and Bob Cabana, two astronauts on that flight. Sergei's inside the node there. And uh, the node is basically the building block for the, the first part of the space station. Our training continued. We're in the secret rocket factory uh, called the Khrushchev Machine Works. It's in downtown Moscow. And this is the module we're going to live in here. And in uh, July of 2000, that module called the service module also went to orbit from Kazakhstan. Uh, after they had docked and that all got checked out, we're getting ready to go to the launch pad. And part of this is a ceremony. This is Red Square and Lance Tomb. The Russian space program has a lot of history to it. And their traditions are very strong. And we salute these as team members. Here we are in Kazakhstan. Uh, this is a museum right next to the launch checkout area. And this is where 50 years of Russian uh, space activity has all been chronicled. And we uh, sign some postcards and make some log entries and books. But the real treat, the real treat was to go next door to the museum. And you'll see that in a second here. Here we are walking outside. This is the cottage where Yuri Gagarin in 1961 is where he stayed before he became the first person to leave the planet and go north. So three days before our launch, our booster rocket rolls out with our capsule on top of it. It goes out on a big rail car and it goes about three miles from the processing area out to the physical launch pad itself. And here you see uh, early in the morning out in the desert, it's real foggy. The Russians just crank that uh, diesel up and out it goes. The uh, hydraulic erector is holding the rocket up straight and then it's going to be fueled. And October 31st, 2000, is the day of our launch, we get up early in the morning. We have a little routine, we have a uh, little uh, Good build section with the Orthodox Tracer. <laughs> and then we have our white pressure suits on. Yuri's going to fly the booster rocket up into space. He salutes the general in charge of the launch area. And off we go to the launch pad. So here we are. We are at the base of. 250,000 pounds of rocket, fully fueled, ready to go, smoking, hissing, whizzing, burring. And there are 400 people right there. Half of them were drinking, the other half of them were smoking. We get in an elevator, we go to the top of the capsule, we jump in, we close the hatch, and get ready to go. So here we are, early afternoon. Kazakh time. And they're going to fire the engines up. It's going to take about six seconds for the liquid engines to get the full thrust and then let that, that sucker go. Three, two, one. Heavy mission, heavy mission, and liftoff. Liftoff of the Soyuz rocket began the first expedition to the International Space Station and setting the stage for permanent human presence in space. We go bam, right into a cloud bank. There was no, <laughs> no way the U.S. would have launched a spacecraft that day, but the Russians just pressed the button and off we went. So here we are in our capsule. This is our actual astronaut. We're feeling three times the force of gravity pushing us back into our seats. Now we've uh, taken the, okay, the windscreen off the top of the capsule, but we're still going up into space. You see a little uh, bumping around here, and my thumb comes out. And we're really happy because we are at the end of our nine minute accident, and we're up in space now. Yes, this looks good. Survey in the middle. You see, the, the couches are really small, and the capsule is very tight. We have to stay in there for about two orbits of the Earth. A little more than three hours. 
Well, the ground protects everything out and makes sure what air is like. We're not thinking we need gas in the future. A couple more later, we get out of the capsule. And here we are in a living compartment that's on top of our uh, asset capsule. This is where we're going to live for two days because we are chasing a space station. We're in the same orbital plane as the space station. Or underneath it and behind it, and it takes us two days to catch up to it. So sleeping up there, you're sleeping in the center couch in the Soyuz capsule. And Sergey's holding the video camera, and we're up in the living compartment here. And standing around, we're drying out one of the spacesuits there because it's kind of sweaty. was kind of sweaty when we got out of it. And over on the side. We can see uh, Flight Engineer 2 cutting some Z's. And the thing about it is, you're going in and out of sunlight every 40 minutes, so you've got to put something up over your eyes so the light doesn't wake you up. And this is where we're going to go. This is our new home in space. We're about a half a mile away, and we're going to rendezvous with the back end of that thing and dock in this big ring. You can see it in a second here. That's a little radar spinning there. We're getting closer here. This is all done automatically on computer control from the spacecraft. And this is our docking camera transmitting the picture to Moscow. This is what it looked like in Moscow Mission Control. We're going to go into that cone on the upper part of the picture. All of our commands at this point of flight, everything's in motion. Let's look upon this as the real opening of the international space frontier, not just for a country, but for Russia, America, Europe, Japan, Canada, and all of the world. Okay, so early November we're up in space and we're in our house and now we have to plug everything in and make sure it all works. So that's what we're doing here. We're all pretty technical guys. This is really the fun part of the flight right here. Mary was talking to Moscow on the UHF radio. And you're in Sergei are fixing part of the air conditioning system. So we can basically control the humidity inside the spacecraft. And then 10 days after our uh, accident, the first cargo ship came up. And its radar had some problems trying to lock on the right docking area. So here we have to take command and grab it and fly it like that and tune it right here. When we uh, get the cargo ship aboard, we open the hatch. The hissing you can hear is it carries air and oxygen, camera, uh, film, food, clothes, a lot of stuff that we need. Early on uh, in December, the first shuttle came up. Um, this is Endeavour. They're putting on the first of four large solar arrays. This is how we get our energy up there, our electric power. We make it from the sun, we store it in batteries, and when we're on the lit side of our orbit, we're generating juice, we're on the dark side, we're running off the batteries, and this is part of the whole system. Two astronauts went outside, they did three space walks to hook all this up. And then after that was done, about eight days after we started, we could open the hatches between the shuttle and the space station, and the crews could greet each other and exchange some more cargo. <laughs> This is something that they do in navies around the world, and they've been doing this for a thousand years, and they're doing it in space now. So this is when Endeavour pulled away, you can see the big rays out there. 
and this is the winter of 2000. We're continuing to work on building out our house. And uh, Sergey's fixing some cable that has a bent pin on it. A big part of our day was to get some exercise, so we stayed reasonably healthy in space. We had a treadmill, a bicycle, and uh, a little uh, jumble gym thing, which sort of proved very beneficial to have some kind of load on your muscles while you're out uh, of The highlight of the day was to uh, get at the food. We had a galley. Uh, the American food was what they eat in the shuttle, which a big part of it's the same diet that the military would eat when they're out on an expedition. And the Russian food uh, is, a, a, I wouldn't say it's more specialized, but it's, it's a lot it's a lot more uh, aligned to what the cosmos like to eat. And I really like the Russian food. I'm very surprised, but, I, but I, that was the way it struck me. So Sergey has got a bag of tea and uh, he's spinning it around to move the bubbles where he wants them. Another interesting thing about the human body is in space, it doesn't care which way it's headed. You know, and that, that you can function normally in space. Um, this is amazing. Zero and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis with Destin. So January the second of the three shuttles came up to visit and uh, brought aboard a big uh, module called Destiny. This is the centerpiece of the United States research today on the station. It's a big laboratory module. Uh, two astronauts went outside, uh, hooked up plumbing, the wiring, uh, the power supplies, the data lines. Tom Jones right here and another astronaut, Bob Kirby, and they were outside for about a week walking around the outside of this module hooking all that stuff up. Our crew was on the inside, and here I am uh, inside the Destiny module opening the window shutter for the first time, and I've got my golf shirt on, Bob Kirby's outside, and it's minus 200 degrees. missions, one to swap out 
the crew between Expedition 1 and Expedition 2, and also to dock a logistics module uh, made in Europe by the Italians called uh, Leonardo. And this is a way that we transfer really big items of equipment from the ground and put them up into space. And this is how it was done. This is the interior of Leonardo and it's full of cargo. And it also has some very big equipment racks. Single-handedly extracting a rack. That rack weighs 800 pounds. Houston, the first expedition crew is present and accounted for. Change of command is an ancient naval tradition. The passage of responsibility for mission, welfare of crew, and integrity of vessel from one individual to another. Space Station Alpha has been commissioned in orbit. The service module has been activated. The power element and laboratory module have been brought aboard. A successful resupply mission with Discovery and her crew is complete. Station is in normal condition. All systems functional and ready to carry out operations. We are on a true space ship now, making our way above any earthly boundary. We are not the first crew to board Alpha. We're the last to depart. But we have made Alpha come alive. We gave her a name and put substance to the ideas that our crews can work together as equals and our countries as partners. That we may proceed with bolder and more enterprising voyages in space with benefit from our differences and with a stronger purpose in our common goals. We pass to your care Alpha's law with the hope that many successful entries here are recorded, that explorations are prodigious and discoveries wondrous. May the goodwill, spirit, and sense of mission we have enjoyed on board endure. Sail her well. I am ready to be relieved. And then we first change of command between any two countries in space, U.S. and Russia, and now we do it every five or six months. We got on Discovery. We had a look at the space station that we had helped to build while we were there. Two days later, the Discovery crew, early in the morning, landing on the runway in Florida. The main gear touchdown. Kelly will be deploying the drag shoot in a moment. Discovery rolling out on runway 15 of the Kennedy Space Center, wrapping up a 5.3 million mile mission, bringing home the first residents of the International Space Station after four and a half months in orbit. The space station, the, the space shuttle crew went four and a half million miles. The space station crew went two thirds of the way to Mars. So here we are back in Houston, which is where our families are, where all of our operational support was based, and all of our training took place. And part of NASA's culture is a big arrival ceremony. Uh, we have a hangar full of friends, associates, NASA people from the Johnson Space Center. And uh, I got to say, I have my dogs, but if you want to see my wife, you see Kate, I don't want to say I have her. And so it was uh, quite the scene, uh, a lot of great speeches, you know, and screaming, but and then all settled down. We had some time kind of behind the scenes to thank all the people that have supported us, uh, 
meet with other astronauts, Mike Bird, Peter Astronaut, Yuri with his two sons. And I was trying to get my dogs to figure out who it was. And they finally, they finally got it. And that was our mission. So, we can bring up the lights, please. Okay, we got three, we got room for three questions. But since the room is big, young men. What was the best part about being in space? What was the best part about being in space? Excellent question because it's one of the things I want to talk about. <laughs> Early on, NASA and Moscow wanted their space programs for the space station to run like they had flown their previous missions from Russia and how NASA had done Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the Space Shuttle, which is very much like flying an airliner where the ground is telling you where you got to go, what altitude to be at, when to climb, when to turn, when to come down, and that's a necessity for safe flight. However, the space station, particularly in its early year, first year in orbit, with people on it, did not have continuous communication with the ground because we did not have the satellite antenna up where we could see the satellite network and have continuous communication, which is what they have now. We had long periods, sometimes four to six hours, where we were not in communication with anybody on the ground, nor could anybody on the ground see what was happening with all the machinery on the space station? So we said, look, the crew, we have to have the authority to do what we have to do if it's particularly an emergency. So the ground being the last straw on what we do and what we don't do is not going to work here because if, we, if we're in the middle of the Pacific, we can't talk to anybody and we have a, let's say we have a fire and we have to evacuate, who's going to do it? So there was a big contention about that this crew was not willing to be, if you will, subordinate to their respective control centers. And I said, no, that's not the point. The point is the model for how we interact as expeditionary people with our home base, it's the wrong model. The happiest moment I had in space was one day we flew over Houston and we usually get up, we get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee and I'd be reading my messages from the ground and coming out of the laptop and printed out. And so Houston would say that thing that we, we'd be talking to him on the radio, we'd say that thing that we we're supposed to do at 8 o'clock or at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we want to change that and put some other task in. We'd say, okay, fine, we'd write that down. 30 minutes later, we'd go over to Europe and we'd be hooked up, we'd be talking to Moscow. And Moscow would say, that thing that you're supposed to do at 2 o'clock, don't do what Houston said, do something else because we want this task to take its place. And this happened a couple of times. And I got on the horn one day and, and I had a, and Houston can hear what Moscow says and Moscow can hear what Houston says. And I said, I had one of these contradictory events between Houston and Moscow. And I said, uh, gentlemen, Eta Blaha Mucha, which is Russian for that is BS. And I said, we are on one international space station. We are one crew on one mission. We will fly one plan to get this flight done. We are not going to fly a plan for Moscow or a plan for Houston. You guys take a step back. When you've got that organized, call us and we'll execute that thing, not the ones we're sending us. That was my happiest day on the world. And I think it's very important because that changed the whole character 
of how that that whole enterprise operates now. We're not talking about really about something that's going around here. This is the stepping stone for where humans will go beyond Earth orbit, probably beyond the moon, and maybe even beyond Mars, and how they're going to interact with their supporting nations and organizations to get the job done. That is why this is so important. Next question. What effort can the U.S. make to promote more space exploration? I, uh, I talk a lot about it. I, I don't think it's a simple answer. Uh, how many people here have flown on an airliner? How many people haven't flown on an airplane anywhere? Anybody? Okay. Sorry about that, but when you're, when you're on the airliner, do you think about how the airplane flies? Maybe when you were a kid and you were flying with your parents somewhere and you asked your dad or your mom, you said, hey, uh, why is that wing looking like that? What's that round thing out there? It's the engine. What's going on? And did, did anybody ever listen to an explanation like that and hear what your, you know, your school teacher or your parents said about what's happening? Did anybody hear that? Yeah, sure. It's very common. And so the explanation would be something like, the air goes faster over the top of the wing, it creates low pressure, and it holds the wing up, and that's what's keeping everything up in the air. It's basically what's going on. Okay, so um, when you think about what did it take to make that airliner, there were a bunch of people that were all real smart folks, engineers and scientists and managers, and they designed a wing for that airplane. They knew all that stuff. And the people that put the engines together had the same sense of what the engines needed to do. And you could take it down to nuts and bolts. I mean, if you're on an airliner, does it matter if the brakes are good? Sure, of course it does. So the guys that design the brakes need to know a lot about what they're doing to make those things efficient. So when I see an airplane fly, I'm thinking of the thousands of people who in their minds had it right about what was making all this work. Space, rockets, space stations, it's the same thing. The reason why that rocket goes off into space, the reason why this space station flies, is because you had this tens of thousands of people around the globe who wanted to build a space station that worked and knew something about how to do it. And the reason why they were allowed to do it was because their, their nations, their populaces, thought it was important and supported them. Okay, great story, but it's all going to implode if people don't have the, aware, the public awareness of what the space program is about and what it takes to do it. So my, my answer to you is, it takes an educated population that thinks space is important, who's willing to put leaders in Washington to get it done. And that's what we are wrestling with now. We are at a point in the United States, we're at crossroads. We are at a point where we can move out, develop the technologies, to go back to the moon, put humans on Mars, or we're going to be living on this nice, comfortable orb for the rest of eternity, and that's all there is. Or some other country or organization is going to do it. The time to make that call is right about now. And I don't know what the answer is going to be. Last question. One last question. Young lady. Uh, what do you see as the future of the International Space Station? What do I see the future of the International Space Station? Uh, Good question. I think in the short term, the space station is up there to do research in about eight areas of, broad areas of science. Uh, one of the biggest things is to understand the human biology that's going on when we're weightless for a long period of time, we want to go somewhere else. That's really valuable. We're learning, learning incredible things 
uh, particularly about humans' eyesight. We didn't know even 10 years ago that we're just beginning to understand that it all gets affected by zero gravity. Radiation's a big problem if you're out in space because you don't have the ionosphere and the atmosphere to protect you. And so how are we going to manage that on long flights? That's all near term. Let me talk about the long term. What is space station? Space station is a place where people live and work right now. If you would you get them on the phone tonight and ask them and say, hey uh, guys, uh, where are you? What are you doing? They, they'd be around the globe somewhere and they, 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 do, they do this once in a while to groups. And they'd say, okay, you know, we see. They would, they would see themselves as not living on the Earth anymore. The Earth is there out the window. Sure, it's 200 miles away, but they're in their own separate environment. And essentially, they're in a little world. <laughs> Space Station is asking the question right now, is it possible for humans to live and work and be productive somewhere else away from Earth. And that's why this is so important. Let me tell you really some quick stuff. People ask me, say, Bill, uh, what's it going to take to put humans on Mars? And I said, well, you know, we thought about that. When we were designing the space station, it was in the back of our mind, does the space station tell us anything now about a mission to Mars and what things are going to look like? And I thought several things. One, a vehicle or vehicles that go to Mars for a human expedition, they're going to be really big. Space Station is 500 tons. It's a small ship. The stuff going to Mars is going to be that big or even bigger. These vehicles are too big to be launched even by the largest boosters from the surface of the Earth. They're going to have to be sent up in multiple flights. And they're going to have to be assembled and checked out in Earth orbit. And, and, they're going to have to draw on the resources and the ingenuity and the dedication of lots of different people in lots of different countries. That's, that's the way this is going to go down. And so if you have to ask, what's up with Space Station, why it's important, Space Station, if you look at those three or four characteristics for going to Mars, those questions are behind us, the Space Station. Thank you very much.